Now, one thing I want to stress about utility theory, and this will help lead us into our next series of examples, is it's very important to make progress on a lot of problems to keep your model simple. And I'll try to explain one reason why. One reason why is just to think about how much complication comes in as I add more goods to the problem. So, for example, in the n equals 2 case, right? And if you thought about describing a demand curve or a demand system locally, so you start at a point and you say, I'm going to try to describe this demand system locally, sort of a local approximation to his demand curve. And you ask, well, how many parameters does that really have? How, much, how many parameters exist? Well, you can say, well, geez, I got two shares. I got the share of good one, and I got the share of good two. I have two income elasticities, the income elasticity of good one and the income elasticity for good two. I got four price elasticities, epsilon one, one, epsilon one, two, epsilon two, one, epsilon two, two. You could say, well, in some sense, there are eight parameters of interest, right? Because this tells me where I start. Give me his income. This tells me how much of each good he's spending on each good. This tells me how does good one respond to income. This tells me how does good two respond to income. This tells me how each of the goods responds to each of the prices. So if I knew all these things, I could ask any hypothetical question I want about how he would respond. If I gave him a little more income and I gave him a higher price, I could do any of those kind of experiments. Right? Now, you should say to me, well, geez, there's not really eight parameters. Because once I know some of these, I know the other ones. Right? The most obvious one is the shares, right? Shares, there's really only one, right? Once I know share of good one, guess what? It's pretty easy to guess the share of good two, right? So this has only got one. Adding up, remember, weighted average of those income elasticities has got to be one, weighted by the shares. So once I know the shares, if I know one of the income elasticities, I know the other one. And how many independent price elasticities are there? Think about it. If I told you epsilon 1, 1, and I told you eta 1, you could get epsilon 1, 2 from homogeneity, right? Got to be homogeneous to degree 0. So homogeneity would give me epsilon 1, 2 once I knew epsilon 1, 1 and eta 1 and the shares. Once I had epsilon 1, 2, I could get epsilon 2, 1. Symmetry would allow me to go from epsilon 1, 1 to epsilon 2, 1. Remember, they're not equal. right? They're not equal. The derivatives are equal. The elasticities are asymmetric according to the shares. But still, if I know the shares and I know one of them, I can know the other one. And then once I know the other one, I can get that one by homogeneity. I could have equally well done it by adding up. It doesn't matter. I could go either, either path. Any of those paths would lead me to the same conclusion. The basic conclusion is there's only one substitution parameter, which makes sense. Right? I told you you can't substitute for good one. Then what must also be true? You can't substitute for good two. Right? You can't have you substitute. Two for one, but not one for two. It just can't work. Right? It's got to be. So there got to be only three parameters. Okay. Now, what would happen if I went to n equals three? 
what would the corresponding numbers be? Well, now there would be two independent shares. Everybody agrees? Once I know two of them, I know the third. There would be two independent income elasticities. So the only question is, how many independent price elasticities are there? And here, it's easy to draw a picture. Think about my matrix, right? Epsilon 1, 1, epsilon 1, 2, epsilon 1, 3, epsilon 2, 1, epsilon 2, 2, epsilon 2, 3, epsilon 3, 1, epsilon 3, 2, epsilon 3, 3. Got my three, my, ni my nine quote price elasticities. Symmetry will say basically if I know every number below the diagonal, I know every number above the diagonal, so I can get rid of the top of the diagonal, right? Then you could say, well, adding up would say if I know these two, I know that one, right? Everybody agrees with that? So basically, adding up or homogeneity is going to do what? Basically, if I told you these three, you could fill the rest in, right? If I told you this, if I tell you these three, then in this case, there's only one left. I can use homogeneity. In this case, there's only one left. I can use homogeneity. In this case, there's only one left. I can use homogeneity, right? I tell you these three, you get those three, and then there's only one left in each row, and you can use homogeneity. Or there's only one left in each column, and you can use adding up. Whichever path you want to take will work, and they'll give you the same answer. So once I have symmetry and either homogeneity or adding up, I can use that to conclude there are three parameters here. Okay? Which non-trivially means there's now seven parameters here versus only three here. So when I went from two goods to three goods, the world got a lot more complicated. But it's even worse than it looks, all right? It's worse than it looks. First off, these parameters are relatively easy to get, right? Share parameters are the easiest ones to get. I like to think about it as even accountants can get these, right? We have any accountants out here? I love to insult accountants. It's always fun. <laughs> Even accountants could get these, right? You don't need that. You don't, and the point is, you don't need any experiments to get these, right? You don't need to have any hypothetical exercise. It's just data. Just what are the shares? These are income elasticities. And do is it easy to see variation in income holding <laughs> prices constant? Yeah, that's something we think we could get a pretty good handle on. Because you can have a single market, lots of variation in income, holding prices constant. There's nothing about a market that says income is going to be constant. Income can be very different, and everybody faces the same prices. Right? Easy to have that. These parameters are tough because, in general, we think about in a given equilibrium, everybody facing the same prices. We're back to the best buy problem we had. Guys walked into the same store. They paid the same prices. Here, I need the prices to vary, holding other things constant. So these are kind of the hardest parameters to get, hardest parameters for economists to identify, these, these elasticities. And unfortunately for us, that's the one that went up the most. What if I went to four goods? Well, this would be three. This would be three, and this would be, I would add another row of off diagonals. I would add three more, right? This would go to six. I would go to six here, right? Now I got six of these nasty price the last substitution parameters I got to figure out. Much, much more complicated. And that's why, in general, if you look at the way economists approach problems, they rarely estimate unrestricted demand functions with lots of goods. They just get too unwieldy to really get much mileage on. 
So when people go to lots of goods, they go to very restrictive forms of demand. They use discrete choice models, for example, that greatly restrict the elasticities across different parameters. And people say, well, geez, that's not fair. You're restricting them. But it's the, you really got almost no choice in some sense. It's really hard to estimate just unconstrained all the parameters of a demand system with lots of goods. So what I'm trying to tell you is there's going to be a huge premium if you can at keeping your model toward this end. In fact, try your darndest not to get out of that row. Not surprising, the workhorse models we tend to use in economics tend to be very simple. Right? We have the, you know, you guys take macro, right? They just beat the two good model to death, right? C and L, that's it. And if they want to go across time, they make it in a very simple, separable format to keep life as simple as possible, right? That's going to be the name of the game. You got to. An unrestricted demand system with lots of goods just has too many parameters, and in particular, has too many of these substitution parameters that are very hard to get accurate estimates of. So there's a big premium on keeping your model toward this end of the spectrum. All right, we'll stop here and pick up from here next time.